Hey guys, this is Sean. This is Nathan. And you're listening to Petri Dish. We wanted to start out this episode by kind of um, framing it a little bit. This is going to be kind of like a prequel to a series that we're going to be doing on climate change. Phantom Menace to A New Hope. <laughs> no. Or Return of the Jedi. <laughs> like the like, best Star Wars movie. Like a good prequel. <laughs> Not like <laughs> Hobbits Part 1 and 2, but like an actual good prequel. So in this case, we're going to be talking about how animals can impact their environment and ecosystem in a really large way. Uh, animals that are kind of broadly termed ecological engineers. So guys, we hope you enjoy... Because the next couple episodes are about climate change, which, in a way, is the story of how we're going to kill off all these other ecological engineers <laughs> with our ecological engineering. Yeah, so it's going to get kind of dark. This one is not, so I hope you enjoy it while you still can. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Science! Science! Yes. science. I know the human being and science can coexist peacefully. This was our finest. Guys, you're listening to Petri Dish, and there's all these fires going on in Amazon right now. My dear Presidente Bolsonaro has been fighting for my Brazilian rights <laughs> and been letting the Amazon burn. And I asked Sean, I said, oh man. What's going on with all these humans impacting their environments? And Sean and his typical sciencey bullshit is like, well, you know, Nathan, many animals, flora y fauna, have a large impact on their environment. Why am I even here for this podcast? You can just do both of our parts. That was pretty much perfect. <laughs> well, then he gets me some notes about, quote unquote, environmental engineers, about creatures that impact the environment. Sean, what are you talking about? I thought humans were the only things that, you know, planted crops, killed rainforest, and made money for families. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think there's this kind of idea out there, you know, of, like, the rest of nature being in this kind of Lion King style, like, ah, Savannah, you know, like, circle of life, beautiful That's thing. racist. <laughs> it is a little racist. Yeah. <laughs> You're not full Asian. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not full of anything. Um... <laughs> And that, you know, humans come in kind of Fern Gully style and just start, like, ripping up the forest and everything, right? So human beings are these kind of, like, disruptive outside force. But, you know, for 300 million years, maybe longer, animals have been interacting with their environment. They've been shaping their environment, too, in a really similar way to how we do it. Well, well I mean, they shape their environment the same way that, like, fucking a leaf cutter ant cuts a leaf and, like, makes some fungus, right? Like, they don't, like, change things. They just live where they live, right? Ranging from mega herbivores like right. elephants and mammoths down to like beavers and termites, we're talking about all kinds of animals that are having really profound, large scale impacts on their ecosystem. So, well, wait, like a beaver will dam up a river and that'll change the course of a river, like it's changed the river forever. You telling me elephants have made Africa Africa? Yes, there are also Asian elephants now who's racist. <laughs> okay. Oh, gotcha, gotcha journalism. <laughs> Sean David Allen, PhD in gotcha journalism. But in any case, yeah, that, that is what I mean, that elephants can impact their environment in just as big, if not, in fact, a bigger way than that kind of, you know, beaver dam impact. Because they're bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, in a certain sense, because they're bigger, because they belong to this class of thing called mega herbivore. Okay, so guys, we're going to go through all these animals. We're going to go through the ways that they have really fundamentally shaped their environment, and we're going to start with those motherfuckers. We're going to start with those herbivores. Yeah, mega the, ones. The mega ones. Okay. So, mega herbivores shape their environment, create their environments. Sean, what the fuck is a mega herbivore? Right, so this one's not too bad to break down. Herbivore, herb. All right, so we're talking about plants. Marijuana smokers. <laughs> <laughs> Vore, okay, so that's eaten. Okay. And then mega, so big ass. So, big ass marijuana eaters. Yeah, that's right, dude. So, we're talking... Basically, plant eaters that weigh over a ton. Ah, okay. What are some examples of mega herbivores then? Okay, mega herbivores have a history going back 
about 300 million years and way, way back then. That was before dinosaurs. We're talking about some funky, big, pre-reptile-y kind of dudes running around. Yeah. Um, and then they got displaced, basically, by dinosaurs. And dinosaurs were the main mega herbivores for a while. You know, like the brontosaurus, really long-necked dude. Okay. And then those fuckers all got wiped out. And that stretch of time after the dinosaurs got wiped out is actually the longest period of not having a mega herbivore around. Besides, um, like, the first three billion years of <laughs> Yeah, besides, besides <laughs> the three billion years. Right, sure. It took about 10 million years of evolution to restore the mega herbivore niche. Okay. To make new mega herbivores. And at that point, they were mostly mammals. Okay. And we're talking, like, mammoths and shit. Okay, cool. So, like, furry... Uh, elephants. Yeah, furry elephants. And I mean, realistically, these these kinds of animals that have the proboscis, the what? elephant-like mammals, uh, oh. are actually a huge family of mega herbivores. Like, so give me a list, right? We got uh, mammoths. We got, of course, modern elephants. What are some other mega herbivores? Just yeah, so quick. there were giant rhinos. There was the cool. giant ground sloth. Right, right, right. And when we talk about giant elephants and giant horses and everything like that. Uh, we're talking about, oh, and giant camels. These guys were all families of animals. Like right now, we kind of think of, you know, there's maybe three kinds of elephants. There used to be dozens of kinds of elephants on almost every continent. Right. And so pretty much every continent had at least one, if not six to 18 mega herbivore species. Yeah. Like, I've seen Dumbo. Like, I know what elephants do. They just walk around and, like, trunk up trees and do stuff like that. Like, they don't... They just live in Africa, dude. They're like, or Asia, Asia, not racist. Asia <laughs> and Africa. They don't do anything special. So, mega herbivores actually shape their environment in really, really significant ways. Okay, so, not only does it play into the fact that they eat a lot of food, so what they decide to eat really drastically changes the environment. Some mega herbivores are very selective in what grasses they eat. I hate picky mega herbivores. <laughs> I hate them. I was working at Italy making fresh pasta, and this elephant walked in. I was like, do you have gluten-free pasta? And I was like, you son of a bitch elephant. <laughs> Go back to Africa, and I got fired. <laughs> Elephants actually like to eat a lot of different plants. Okay, oh, they buddy. Do. Yeah, American bison is a good example. I thought you were gonna say American people. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> we're mega mega carnivores. We're very picky. I know what garbage we eat. <laughs> we're like raccoons. The American bison is actually a good example of one that eats particular grasses while it's grazing. Oh, that's interesting. And so it can actually set up patches and areas where they've kind of eaten out a certain kind of grass and allowed other grasses to grow, and that can provide a food source for other herbivores. But with elephants. A lot of times they'll go to a certain area and they'll clear out a lot of sort of the underbrush. They'll tear up a lot of the shrubs and they can actually tear down branches from trees, eat a couple of the leaves and then kind of leave the branches strewn around. Disgusting. So, <laughs> one of the big ways that mega herbivores and especially elephants can affect their environment is kind of replacing tree growth with plains and grasslands. And elephants do that in a lot of different ways. They'll just, like, take their tusks and start rubbing them on trees and kind of tear off the bark and kill just, like, a shitload of trees. Isn't that the doomsday scenario of what we're doing to the Amazon right now? <laughs> I mean, there are some similarities in that when you look at how these mega herbivores had a tendency to get rid of forests... Humans also have a tendency to get rid of forests for agriculture. That's why the elephant is the symbol of the Republican Party. Right-wing movements <laughs> are deforesters because they're elephant people. Yeah. The new conspiracy theory and just invented. they're pro-farmer. Okay, pro they're pro-American farmer, just like elephants. It's just like elephants. <laughs> so they can slowly clear out forest entirely. Right, yeah. So elephants can, can clear out forests and push back forest growth. So in areas of Africa where elephants were kind of hunt overhunted, uh, they saw a kind of resurgence of forest growth. So there are more and more trees in these areas. So it is good to kill elephants. Well, <laughs> but what I will say is that the kind of environment that the elephants carve out while they're destroying these trees can actually be advantageous to a lot of other animals. How so? Yeah, so one example is... When they are tearing down the branches of trees and kind of throwing them all over the place, they actually create cover for reptiles and amphibians to both hide from the sun and from predators like birds. So they actually create little micro-environments for other animals to live in. Okay. And 
in addition to that, when they do things like fell entire trees, just knock trees over, they actually introduce a lot of leaves to smaller herbivores that would normally not be able to reach them. It's like when a rich person accidentally knocks over someone's trash, all sorts of other people who need that trash for, you know, various reasons, <laughs> they like rush over and you've created this whole little ecosystem. <laughs> <I feel> like... <laughs> and raccoons. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this metaphor started out stronger. <laughs> kind of lost its way. But it's somewhere. right, right? <laughs> yeah. That, yes, that, that is the gist of it. Even things like elephant poop. Unlike cows, which are very, very greedy, yeah. okay, and their poop has extracted a lot of the nutrients, elephants will sometimes have whole undigested leaves and shit in their wow. poop. Wow. Okay? So when they poop that out, their poop has this kind of crazy texture to it. A lot of times you'll find toads and stuff like that living in their poop. Wow. Uh, along with a bunch of, like, insects and stuff. Dude, that's just like a paper I read about rich people's poop. Ann Arbor was taken <laughs> to Detroit for urban farming. Damn it. Right? <laughs> it's amazing how similar elephants are to human Republicans. Why are you turning this into class warfare? Okay, that's too far. <laughs> not everything needs to be about eating the rich, okay? Okay, 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 fine, 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 fine. We're not going to eat the rich tonight. So, okay, so that's interesting. So, first of all, they deforest. Uh, how long does that process take? Yeah, it can be very quickly. It can wow. be, like, within a human generation, you can see elephants really drastically alter the amount of trees in an environment. Uh, that's actually what they've seen, is that in some of these areas in Africa, these preservation efforts have allowed elephants back into certain areas where they were they had been gone for a while due to overhunting. And as these elephants come in, they just tear the shit out of those trees really fucking fast. We're talking about even within 20 years, really drastically changing the environment in that sense. But these are forest elephants, right? Uh, so in this case, I'm talking about like the kind of prototypical African elephant. So it doesn't care if it's in a forest or savanna? So in this because case... Because it's destroying its environment, right? Right. So it's basically coming up to the edge of the new forest growth into the savanna. And it's starting out from the savanna and it's tearing up kind of that new forest. Wow. Yeah, and, you know, in that process, elephants do a lot of stuff with relation to tearing things up, including the earth. So elephants will a lot of times uh, dig wells or will kind of carve out mud to get minerals to eat. Damn. So they'll eat certain certain kinds of mud in order to get micronutrients, basically. Uh, they'll just straight up eat dirt as probiotic. Yeah, but they'll dig it out. So they'll go in with their tusks. And, and they'll actually kind of carve into the earth to get deep enough to pick up, you know, things like phosphorus and chromium and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And, you know, in, in that process, uh, they will create kind of new little small waterways for things like toads and fish to be able to live in. It's so interesting because, like, it seems like they're, they're so destructive of a species, but they are creating little niches within those 20 years until they just completely ass blast the forest. And then the whole thing falls out. Well, I mean, so this is actually a huge debate right now in the conservation community is whether the reintroduction of elephants to these environments are actually helping or hurting diversity, because in a certain sense, they are destroying an environment. Right. But they are also creating a new one. Right. And how do you kind of weigh those against each other? Right. But I think that that is not actually so distant from what human beings do. I was about to say, it's kind of besides the point for our conversation, these animals clearly have a giant impact on their environment. They, they fundamentally create it or destroy it. Yeah, and in another way that's analogous to people, um, elephants, by nature of eating a bunch of plants and not digesting them all the way, but also being gigantic and just fucking walking super long distances, actually spread plants and their seeds over very large distances. Sure. So where there are elephants, you can see the sort of like increase of the range of plant species. So they're introduced to new kinds of areas. Uh, a lot of plant species will spread their seeds in the wind, for example, but wind spreading tends to put seeds at sort of lower environments. So the, they'll kind of blow down right. or blow against a hillside, whereas elephants don't give a shit. They'll walk up a hill. They don't care. And so you can actually see elephants spreading seeds in ways that they wouldn't naturally, so to speak, without intervention. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's a lot like people. We took seeds all over the place when we were colonizing islands and stuff like that. We took right. we took various, uh, you know, fruits along with us and colonized all of those guys. Sure. I saw the movie Moana. <laughs> they didn't have coconuts on that island originally. No, nah, dude, they brought it along. They brought coconuts. Yeah. Yeah. 
and African Sparrows or something like that. I think that's the same movie. No, is that different? <laughs> <laughs> so, is there anything else like elephants? Though? I feel like I've said elephants like 27 times already. Is there any other animal that's like them in the modern world or in the recent world? Yeah, we have bison, which I mentioned earlier. We have hippos. We have white rhinos. But aside from mega herbivores, we also have the entire world of a lot of smaller animals that also play a really major role in ecological engineering. Hey guys, after a quick break, we'll get into those. Hey guys, this is Nathan. You may know Sean from this pod. What you may not know is Sean also gives massages for money. He is not a licensed monsieur, but he does have strong hands. Here are some customer testimonials. I do say, sir, what are you doing with your hands? Another satisfied customer! I tried to book a massage with Sean, and apparently he doesn't schedule appointments with women. I'm happily married. I'm not satisfied. So book today, if you're a man, with Sean. And for a limited time only, new patrons at patreon.com slash petri dish will get a coupon for one free massage. No chicks, no feet. Ick benign science and massage. Donate today. Okay, guys, welcome back. So we've just spent some time talking about mega herbivores and especially elephants and the ways that they shape their environments in as deep a way as we shape our environments. But that makes sense because elephants, they're like really f***ing big. They, you know, take one step and boom, London is gone, right? Yep. Kaiju. Now, what about, you, you? what you have your notes is that we also got like beavers and termites. How the fuck can these little micro engineers affect the world as much as like an elephant. Yeah, man. So let's go in order, like the sort of decreasing in size. So first, let's talk about beavers. I think that there's a really obvious way that beavers can shape their environment. A lot of people know that beavers like to basically cut down trees and build dams, right? So they'll dam up rivers and create these little ecosystems where there's sort of an interruption in the flow of the river, right? right. And so that can really drastically change their environment. It, the whole course just kind of changes a little bit. Right, and there's some flooding into the environment. It changes the types of plants that can grow in that area and everything like that, including their destruction of trees, something that they share in common with elephants. Have you seen a beaver in real life? Uh, no, I don't think so. Every Korean zoo I've been to has a beaver for some reason. Wow. They're fucking ugly and horrifying. Oh. And now it makes sense to me. They're dangerous creatures that hurt our rivers. Get rid of them. Okay. Well, I mean, I think there's a Hot reason. Take. <laughs> I think there's a reason why we loved hunting them. Some people might have thought it was for their fur, but I think it's because they were ugly. Yeah, so they're that's... so ugly. <laughs> they're snarling animals, dude. <laughs> but, but... So, so beavers don't just dam up rivers. Really? They do um, another kind of sort of engineering process, which is that they dig out a lot of mud and dirt around the edges of these wetlands and waterways. And that erodes them. It erodes them, but also can create connectivity between different either beaver ponds or wetlands areas. Mm. And that can actually allow populations of things like fish and amphibians to move from, for example, a wetland that's driving up into a wetland that's larger and more sustainable. And so that they can actually protect species from dying out by basically expanding their habitat zone. Jesus, what beautiful creatures. Yeah. Conservation. Yeah. What ugly, beautiful creatures. Mm, Teddy Roosevelt. And there's... What they look like. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt. But you love Teddy Roosevelt. I know. He's an ugly, beautiful mess. <laughs> Remember the main. <laughs> um, so part of this kind of carving out of their land ends up increasing the complexity of their environment and their ecosystem. So it means there's more of this interface between the wetlands and the dry land area where there's trees... And that allows for more complex ecosystems, more different kinds of animals to be living in the area. Hmm. Uh, and so the beavers typically increase the diversity of areas that they live in. Does it increase the mass of wetlands as well by kind of changing the content of the soil? Yeah, it'll increase the water mass of a wetland area by digging out soil and removing it to other areas. So it's almost like if right now the problem of the Amazon is that if you burn enough of it, it reaches a certain critical mass where it can no longer sustain itself. Mm -hmm. Beavers almost do the opposite with the wetlands. 
they create a, a more powerfully self-sustaining wetlands. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, beavers, in a certain sense, they're kind of like wetland magnifiers. So they can take the wetlands that they're in and they can expand them. They can increase their surface area and interaction with the dry lands and create connections in between wetlands to allow for more transfer between them. So far, we've got elephants as forest mass murderers and then <laughs> beavers as wetland magnifiers. Mm -hmm. What about termites? How the hell do termites have a part in this story? Yeah, man. So I love termites. Okay, just these little fucks running around. They I'm do gonna, so much cool shit. I'm going to tell you, I do too. This spot is going to turn around the public perception of termites. For a eusocial species, which means they're like ants. They have a queen and they have a bunch of workers. Like the English. Yes. Pretty much exactly like the English. Yeah. Except I don't think termites would do Brexit. But in any case, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I think they're smart Ter enough. Termites are like reading the newspapers being <laughs> yeah. like, man, this Boris Johnson yeah, guy's yeah. a dumbass. There's no Boris Johnson termite. <laughs> um, <laughs> fuck. Okay. Yeah. God damn it. We're such nerds. Um, so termites can really significantly impact their local soil environment. A lot of termites will dig tunnels underground. I think that people have seen ant farms where they dig all these tunnels underground. Termites will do exactly the same thing. They'll excavate these tunnels. And in that process, will actually mine for really specific types of clay. So there's kind of rare clay particles in soil. And they'll actually kind of go around, really specifically pick those out, and build their tunnels out of this construction material. Wait, real quick. Because I think most people come into termites thinking like, that's the thing that just ate my house. Sure. Where are we right now? Yeah, so termites are actually located in a lot of different environments. One of the ones that kind of drew my attention the most for ecological engineering is actually in Africa. Uh, Will you pronounce the name of this delta for me? Okavango Delta. I think that's right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Our resident African agrees. Yes. Um, so the uh, Okavango Delta is... I think a really good example of how termites can shape their environment. So to understand that, kind of the way that a termite mound works is that they will dig out a lot of tunnels underground mm. and have a lot of different chambers. They will construct it out of a particular material that they mine out of the soil. Just for the structural integrity of their chambers? Right, structural integrity and then also diffusivity of air and CO2. <laughs> So, what the fuck are you saying to me? <laughs> <laughs> at, uh, gas exchange. So, okay. actually, to, to be able to keep things with enough of an oxygen environment, having clay walls actually works better for them. Oh. Uh, and so, they will build these tunnels, and by gathering all this clay together, termite mounds actually have a significantly higher percent of this clay than all of the land around them. The land that they build, they literally transform into a different texture than the rest of the land. I mean, is that hard, though? Like, there's got to be just clay lying around, right? Yeah, so we're talking about an amount of clay that it's less than 1% of sort of just the dirt around. Mm, and so they've they, got to really mine it. They will specifically find this clay in the dirt around them and collect it into their mound. How big are these fucking termites? Like a pinky? Like like one eighth of a pinky? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something more like your pinky fingernail. So each of these pinky fingernail little motherfuckers has to like pick up a tiny amount of clay that is in 1% of all the things around them and then get enough of that to build a like a chamber for like a whole colony? Right, yeah, they basically mix it with their spit. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's spit clay, and okay. they just kind of build chambers out of that. That's actually how I made my house, too. <laughs> Me and Stacey just spin the bucket for a few days. So <laughs> these, are, stucco. these are incredibly organized communities, and so during the daytime, they'll go out and they'll forage. Termites are herbivores. They eat a lot of uh, detrius, so they'll eat like wood, leaves. All the, everything that the elephant knocked down. And stamped on, yeah, right. exactly. And so they'll gather all this during the day, and then they'll eat it at night. So there's kind of this day-night cycle that happens. And a lot of times, the younger workers, after they eat their food, they'll poop it out. And then other workers will take that poop and craft it into these kinds of these intricate shapes and trellises to grow fungus on. So they'll actually set up fungus farms inside of their homes. Wow, okay. And then the fungus will be able to grow on that poop and produce vitamins and minerals that the termites need to have a more balanced diet. 
You know, I was gonna say, can you imagine if humans grew all their food with shit? And then I kind of had an epiphany about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, oh, compost box. Yeah, for you guys who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but okay, so wow. So, so I can see how that's all really amazing within their own hive, and that's kind of incredible. What does it do to the broader environment that they've just taken all this clay? Yes. So one of the things that happens, particularly in this delta, which as a delta has seasonal flooding. Okay. So this is an area where every year, more or less, rains in a different area, I think in Angola, will end up causing this river to flood and then you'll have a bunch of water around. Termite mounds and the clay that they're made out of will actually end up forming islands in this delta. And those islands will be able to support plant life that is not aquatic, including trees. So the termite mound gets flooded. Or I guess it doesn't get flooded because they designed it to not be flooded. So it doesn't flood as easily. Typically, there will be some flooding and some part of the mound will die and need to be reconstructed. Mm. But they'll be able to build it such that enough of it is above the water level that they actually won't drown. Okay, wow. So there's these islands that are technically termite mounds. Yes. What do other people do with these mounds? Right. So they're basically, it's an extra texture to the ecosystem. So you can have some animals basically hang out and eat the plants that are growing on these mounds because uh, basically terrestrial plants, not water plants, can survive on these mounds where the rest of the land is flooded. And you have the establishment of trees. So eventually you start to see forests form on these mounds over the years. How many years, just out of curiosity? Are we talking like one human life cycle? Yeah, so some of the new forest growth, new trees will be within, you know, a couple decades. And then a single fucking elephant walks through. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) and then you let the elephants in. Right, and this termite's like, god damn it. And they just tear everything up. (laughs) These goddamn elephants from fucking Kenya are destroying my Angolan termite mounds. Yeah, well, it's interesting because even if elephants come in, tear it up, and then leave that land where there was a termite mound, even if the termites are gone, even Mm. if all the termites have died, that land they found will still reestablish things like forests. Because it is uh, elevated. They've, they've left behind a mark on the landscape that can last 100, maybe even, you know, 200 years, centuries. Right, so it's not just frou-frou shit like the microbiome in the dirt is different. Or, you know, like the elephants tore down the branches. It's like literally the land's higher. Right, the land is shaped. And you can you can do a flyover of this delta and you can see the islands. And you can see some of them that are much, much bigger now, but they had started originally... The, the seed of that island was because of a termite. That's mount. beautiful, dude. There's like a fucking Kevin Costner termite. Like, <laughs> if you build it, they will come. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I think that is one of the most stark examples of an ecological engineer because they're so small, but through their collective action, okay? You're right. Workers of the world unite, they oh, will build something beautiful. Okay. So you always turn this so political, Sean, okay? You <laughs> yeah. fucking communist. <laughs> right? That's what the revolution is for. Okay? That, <laughs> look at the termites. Yeah, this is what Bernie is fighting for. I was about for. to say, Bernie's next speech is like, look at the termites. <laughs> <laughs> look at the mouse they build in Wakanda. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've gone through elephants that have this huge impact on forests and savannah. We've got beavers that can empower wetlands, uh, make new wetlands, save other species. We've got termites that just by building mounds and like, I don't know, doing weird fucking fungus farming underground, (laughs) they can elevate the earth, make whole islands, change the landscape that you can see from a goddamn plain. Now this gets us to kind of the stickiest, wackiest vore. We got humans, right? We got to talk about humans now. Um, yeah, yeah. I think if someone were to say ecological engineer, just the word engineer makes you think human. And I really wanted to tackle this because I think when we talk about how humans are changing the environment today, I think people have a lot of misconceptions about it. One of the big ones is about modernity, right? Like the Industrial Revolution, modern technology is what's deeply changing the uh, human's relationship with the environment, which of course is true. But humans are like other fauna. They've been doing this for a long time, especially as agricultural civilizations. And so we're going to take a walk through different ways that humans in pre-modern times have changed their environments. We're going to compare humans to beavers, to termites, to elephants, and look at how they've just completely changed their world. And we're talking even before 
we invented anything like steam engines. Tractors. Tractors. Yep. Monsanto. All right. Let's take a break. Hey, guys. This is Sean. Have you ever been at a party sipping PBR just trying to be seen for once? You hear some people chatting about the latest app they're using. Poops. Using words like microbiome and holobiont. You just ask yourself, uh, Are those nerds talking about me? Do they think they're better than me? They do. But you don't have to keep things that way. Listen to Petri Dish, a science podcast that can catch you up to all those fancy fucks. Well, technically you're listening now, but keep doing it. And spread the word to other dum-dums. Petri Dish so that you can rub knowledge in other people's faces. So guys, welcome back. Now we're going to talk about humans and the way that humans are a part of the story as ecological or environmental engineers. And the story starts with humans as agricultural settlers, right? The ways that we've changed river, used farming. Yeah. Dude, well, I give me that look, man. Well, it's... Uh... Hunter-gatherers, I would say, would probably be the first point of ecological engineering. Wait, time about, dude. Hunter-gatherers are like groups of 40 all banging like bonobos <laughs> walking around Africa. Okay, they didn't do dog shit. What are you talking about? They're trying so, to tear me down. <laughs> well, it's, to me, the first thing that humans did that really changed ecosystems all around the world was their role in eliminating the mega herbivores that came before. Uh, you know. Oh, okay. Like what? Well, okay, so the, there was a huge mega herbivore extinction. Like a lot of mega herbivores that we were talking about earlier, mammoths and giant, giant rhinos spots. and uh, all, all these giant dudes. Yeah. They don't exist anymore. I mean, I think we got that nailed up. I don't think so. Up. I don't think that's right. <laughs> Aside from Bigfoot. I was talking to a giant sloth like three days ago, dude. At the comic book store. <laughs> so, you know, the, they're gone. They're gone. And they've been gone for a really long time. And one of the things that was kind of noted is that in the fossil record, these animals seem to disappear not too long after human beings moved into the area where they're living. I mean, you can't blame them. You're like some random Cherokee bro. You just walked across a land bridge to get into America. Sure. Spoiler, humans got to America. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to America, you see a giant sloth, you're going to eat it. Well, yeah, yeah. And I think that is not just direct predation. So the there have been some opinions out there in the scientific literature that there weren't enough people to directly kill all of the fucking mega herbivores. I don't know, man. I knew this one guy named Brian Allen once, and we just like <laughs> left him in a cow farm overnight. Yeah. He killed 30,000 cows by the next day. Sure, like the Iowa caucuses and those giant uh, turkey legs you know, that we, we love eating. After Pete Buttigieg... There's just not going to be turkeys anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you just kill them all. It snaps their neck. So, it's crazy. <laughs> there's a lot of different competing theories now as to why these mega herbivores died off so soon after human beings showed up. If we don't kill them, then how did they die off? One of the options is that human beings seemed to have used fire to you know a pretty good extent when they moved into new areas. And so there might have been an increase in fire setting that destroyed environments and just straight up killed a bunch of megafauna. It's like how all the fires in Southern California killed off all the rich people's houses. Yeah. And now there's... <laughs> yeah, the, the mega donors. Yeah, the mega donors. Yeah. <laughs> all their houses are gone. <laughs> exactly. It's the same thing. Um, and there's maybe a connection to some climate change. Although... Uh, although... Uh. <laughs> in this particular case, there's not a very good correlation between rapid climate change and these mega herbivore species dying out. So it seems more likely that there's something human related. It's not totally clear what the link is, but humans seem to have been involved and we wiped out a ton of these species. Okay. And not having them around anymore really changed the environment sure. from things like savanna and grassland into things like forests or the tundra in Siberia. Okay, so Ruskies are traveling like eastbound and they find all this just like this mass tundra and Siberian people. Okay, well, that's not a mistake. The Siberian people killed the mammoths, and that's what left it as tundra. Yeah, without the mammoths there to stomp on the ground, basically, which prevented or decreased moss growth and reduced ground moisture, actually changed it from being sort of this uh, the mammoth steppe environment into a tundra environment. 
Okay, and then humans come into North America and there's just a bunch of ground sloths. They kill the ground sloths. And then fast forward several thousand years later, Mel Gibson hops off to Jamestown and he walks into pristine forest. Yep. That forest wouldn't have existed if the megafauna had survived. Right, yeah. He, he would have been walking into a very different situation. Like a, like a giant sloth. Yeah, <laughs> several like, giant sloths. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, saber tooth tigers. Can you imagine if you like went for hot Pocahontas babe action and then it's like a giant sloth or a saber tooth tiger? There's like basically the cast of Ice Age, <laughs> and you're like, this is not the right movie. <laughs> yeah, this is not what I wanted. <laughs> yeah, I'm so mad. <laughs> That's why Mel Gibson freaked out. <laughs> yeah, but but I would say that you know once we get over how drastically we change the environment by getting rid of the mega herbivores, in a certain sense, we kind of replaced them in that these changes that they did, deforestation, right, the spreading of plants, right, that's our agriculture. We basically directly replaced them by felling trees to make room to grow plants. Okay. This gets us into a couple specific groups that I wanted to go through starting first with some agricultural civilizations, medieval Europe. I remember talking once with this really liberal guy, maybe six years ago, and he was talking about how we shouldn't have like invented steam engines. <laughs> what a because, bitch. Because the Industrial Revolution was like bad, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, you know, Europe was like basically already deforested before the Industrial Revolution. He's like, no, man, like humans, villages, peasants, nature, <laughs> okay? And I was like, bitch, no. <laughs> humans had already deforested like most of Europe by then and killed off a lot of the shit just by virtue of hundreds of years of agriculture. Yeah, that's why uh, Robin Hood was like a poacher and shit, was because there's right. like royal forests right? where your normal fucking peasant couldn't go in and just jack off. Like the first... <laughs> <laughs> no jacking off in the forest! Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, <laughs> you were agreeing with me. Yeah, yeah. no, but the first, like, like the first EPA were like the royal laws of the monarchies of England and France and all those motherfuckers, because they would be like, oh shit, we're running out of forest. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't even work! Sure. Because they kept on cutting it down you know you look at earlier records of china or even of greece you know they fight like lions and shit that's not just a myth there used to be lions there used to be different types of fauna there not even just mega herbivores yeah and then we deforested the crap out of it and killed them all off yep the hundreds of years before we started coal mining yeah which, by the way, this is not to say that coal mining is not an important issue for climate change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this, is, now. this is not meant as an anti-climate change screed. <laughs> but anyway, so that's medieval Europe. Now, I think that's entirely plausible for people. But there's a whole other realm of the ways that humans have changed their environment that kind of gets back to what you're talking about. I want to talk about the Americas. Because I've heard this crazy theory that I wanted to talk to you about, about the Amazon being in part a human creation. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I'm going to run it through you real quick. This is not going to sound smart because I'm not Mr. Smarty Science Man. All right. But, like, a good, like, 10% of the Amazon, uh, about the size of France, the soil there is something called terra preta. And this terra preta, it's this, uh, it's this amazing stuff with this really rich microbiome that seems to be able to repair itself from the otherwise draining processes of the rainforest. For guys who don't know, rainforest soil is mostly dog shit. Yeah. Uh, just because it gets drained of so much of its nutrient life. Yeah, not even good dog shit, though. Just just to be clear. Yeah, because dog, dog shit, shit is yeah. good. <laughs> dog shit might have nutrients in it. Yeah. This is very nutrient-poor soil. It's not very good for farming or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, but not for like 10% of the Amazon. And what it's looking like, the more that anthropologists and archaeologists and scientists research it, is it's looking like this stuff was actually made by Native Americans and perpetuated on purpose, such that a portion of the Amazon is not a naturally, well, it is now naturally occurring a rainforest, but in its origin, it's like humans were the beavers of the Amazon. They helped, they like, you know, fucking paddled and scrambled their way yeah. into making a rich ecology that then they could harvest for a, a wide variety of flora. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, they, they, they made the mother, you know, like the mother for the vinegar and stuff like that. I don't even know the reference. What are you talking about? <laughs> when, when you want to make vinegar, you have to kind of inoculate the, what do you make vinegar out of? Wine? I don't know. <laughs> when you, when you, you have to take the wine, you inoculate it. 
uh, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a <laughs> chef. Shit. <laughs> okay, but uh, so you know, like when you want a big bread or something, you, you need to have like a sourdough starter. Okay, good, because I wrote this in the notes. Okay, this I know what this means. It, the mother is the same thing as the sourdough starter, except ah. for vinegar. Okay, okay, I see. It's like this, like really gross, like liver consistency chunk of bacteria shit that like Ugh. grows at the bottom of a vat of vinegar. Wow. Really? And you take a clump of that and you toss it into like Other... a, a cask of wine and it'll turn that wine into vinegar. That's what vinegar is? Yeah, dude. I didn't know that at all. Oh. And that's fucking gross. Oh. I mean, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I eat blue cheese. So like I'm down. <laughs> but I had but but it's weird. It's like you know there's gross things in the world. But then it turns out it's your neighbor or something, you yeah. know? Like, like, like I don't like that. Yeah, once you realize you've had it in your mouth and enjoyed it. Right! I don't mind fun. Ted Bundy existing, generally. <laughs> I don't like the fact that he lives upstairs. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but I... I <laughs> while this was an insane digression, <laughs> I think I get the point of what you're saying. And actually, I've, I've read this, too, that there was sort of this ancient proto-quasi-civilization of indigenous peoples that lived in the Amazon that drastically changed the soil quality in the areas that they lived on purpose. And that it kind of had to have been on purpose because there's not really any convenient natural process that would do this. Right. And so they had to consciously be like trying to actually kind of craft the soil a certain way and then probably grow, you know, certain kinds of plants that would help maintain that soil and everything. And the so Amazon was intelligently designed, if you will. <laughs> oh, <boy. By> God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but but and this, this is also um what I've read is that this is also true in North America, right? Like the forests. When Europeans first came to the forests in North America, they're like, "Oh man, wow, this is so great. God made this as a new Eden for us. And it's like, no, he did it, motherfucker. Like, Native Americans were hunting in those forests, pruning those forests, taking care of those forests as if they're gardens. And then, like, some random Spanish pig ran through Florida, brought smallpox, <laughs> fucking killed 95% of everybody. And so when you come there, all the carcasses are gone by now. And you're like, oh, man, this forest is so pristine. <laughs> but, like, that shit was made by a person. At least in part, it was deeply shaped by a person. The way that termites shape environments or beavers shape environments. Yeah, and, you know, this brings us back a little bit to the debate about things like elephants and i think that's why it applies to people in a certain sense is elephants do destroy an environment right and those same native americans that were maintaining that environment you know at that point hundreds sure. thousands of years later thousands of years earlier had, <laughs> had completely destroyed that environment they right. had completely wiped out entire species um but at this point they were part of sustaining that ecosystem sure so i, I think it's just it's very similar it's analogous to what was going on and I think in a certain sense, similar to what we could be doing now with our environment. So in my research as a PhD, I've heard of a term called niche construction theory that I think <laughs> describes what you're talking about. Now, Sean, even though I'm the PhD, I'm going to turn it over to you. What does that term mean? Niche construction theory. All right. Yeah. Thank you for pulling that out of the notes. Um, niche construction theory, I think, is a really beautiful way to sum all of this up and related a little bit to uh, episode three about evolution. So evolutionary niches are sort of an element of the environment or the ecosystem where a species can fill a role and then have selection based off of that role. So there'll be certain kinds of foods available to it. There'll be certain temperatures they have to deal with. But the way that, that it's normally framed is kind of passive. It's like the animal just kind of has to take whatever its role is. But niche construction theory basically says that animals don't just sit there and take it. You know, they actively form their niche. They shape their ecosystem and their environment. And so it's much more of a push and pull. Animals can help shape the selective pressures that evolution puts on them. And I think that that is, you know, instructive for all the animals that are living out there, but also for human beings too. Right. To put this in a really stupid way, Native Americans come across the land bridge, they could hypothetically evolve to the pressures of a giant sloth, or they could kill the shit out of giant sloth. <laughs> they have not changed their niche, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So I think actually there is some ideas that maybe the impetus 
to move into agriculture was that hunter-gatherers had had so much luck wiping out megafauna and feeling good about it that once they had finished wiping them out, they needed to do <laughs> something else. Yeah, they're, they're like, oh, uh, man, <laughs> <laughs> what happened to all this law? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you see the rise of agriculture actually coincide relatively closely to the loss of the last megafauna species in an area. That's super interesting. So we kill, we finally kill off all the last Mesopotamian, like, fucking, I don't know, like, giant sloths. <laughs> big camels. We kill off all the last big camels in Mesopotamia. And we're like, oh, fuck, we killed off all the big camels. And then we're like, why don't we make a city? <laughs> right. And it's the same kind of story in, like, Mesoamerica. Right. And in Mesoamerica, you can even trace it further, right? So you kill off all the major domesticated animals. You're like, oh, fuck, this really shitty plant, let's turn it into corn. Okay, you turn to corn, you overfarm the Yucatan. Okay, well, whoopsie daisy, you destroy the environment of the Yucatan. All your cities get ass blasted over a few hundred years. And then now you have to readapt <laughs> to the niche that is your ecologically obliterated rainforest. Yeah, yeah. Just, just like there are cycles of population boom and failure as ecosystems can't handle them anymore, human beings have gone through the same shit. Right, and perhaps we may... Go through it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now that we've discussed the ways that different animals and humans can engineer their environments, we got to talk about how modern humans have, like, really, really done some crazy shit to their environments. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about the evidence for it happening, which I think is pretty solid. And then what can we do about it? Which I think is kind of the scarier part of that question. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, yeah. Andrew uh, Yang for president? <laughs> <laughs> Asians can do math. <laughs> Running for higher ground. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, well. If that means leaving Miami, it's like not that yeah, big yeah, of a problem, right? Yeah, <laughs> You're like, <exactly>. easy sell. <laughs> All right, guys. So we got to do some thank yous. Let's thank Stacy Song, sound lord, sound engineer, producer. Um, all Still my wife. Yeah. Yeah. Still married. Made good. it another week. Yeah. So that's not bad. <laughs> uh, we're going to thank Brian Allen. He did the artwork that you can see on our Patreon at patreon.com slash Petri Dish. Same Brian that killed 10,000 cows in one night. Yeah. He Proof. was very brave. <laughs> yeah. He was, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was the cow killing level from Diablo. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> we keep it in. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. All right. We'll see how many people recognize the reference. <laughs> And guys, sign up for Patreon. We can, of course, use your support and are deeply thankful. We're going to ha- start releasing some bonus content for our Patreon uh, supporters. Stuff that is maybe inappropriate for the pod. Yeah, too fucked up to air to, like, just normal people. So so you're going to have to, you're going to have to, you know, buy in on this one because it, it's, it's pretty out there. X-rated. <laughs> so, 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 guys... Thank you again for listening. Uh, find us on all the various sites. Yep. The, the Stitcher and Spotify, podcast, iTunes. Google Play. <laughs> <laughs> all those things. Yeah. Look us up, Petri Dish. Again, thank you. See you later, dudes.